Welcome to Success Story, the most useful podcast in the world. I'm your host, Scott D. Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, as well as the HubSpot Podcast Network. The HubSpot Podcast Network has other great podcasts like Marketing Made Simple, hosted by Dr. J.J. Peterson. Now, Marketing Made Simple brings you practical tips to make your marketing easy and, more importantly, make it work. If you like any of these topics, you definitely want to go check out the show, how to write and deliver a captivating speech, how to market yourself into a new job, how design can help and also hurt your revenue, creating a social media ad strategy that actually works. If these topics resonate with you, go check out Marketing Made Simple wherever you get your podcasts. Today, my guest is Mark Randolph. Mark is a veteran Silicon Valley entrepreneur, advisor, investor, and keynote speaker. He was the co-founder of the online movie and television streaming service, Netflix, serving as their founding CEO, as the executive producer of their website, and as a member of their board of directors until his retirement in 2004. Although he is best known for starting Netflix, Mark's career as an entrepreneur spans more than four decades. He's been a founder of more than half a dozen other successful startups, a mentor to hundreds of early stage entrepreneurs and an investor in numerous successful as well as a large number of unsuccessful tech ventures. So we spoke about him building Netflix from the ground up. We spoke about why no ideas are good ideas. We spoke about issues with over iterating on an MVP. We spoke about the importance of self-awareness, chasing shiny objects, when to give up and a million other entrepreneurial lessons. Well, you know, I, I probably wouldn't describe it as having been pushed toward entrepreneurship. I think it's a little bit closer to being drawn to it. Uh, and it's perhaps better even to, to realize that back when I started, you know, this was 40, 50 years ago, uh, this whole entrepreneurship thing wasn't the thing. I mean, you know, there were people, of course, who started companies. There were entrepreneurs, but no one talked about it. They weren't glorified. There weren't TV shows, movies, podcasts. To be, uh, so it, th- I was not growing up like you grow up, you wanting to be a fireman or a, a doctor or something like that. Uh, I was just someone who was kind of always trying to solve problems or I'd see something that I thought needed doing and I'd begin wondering, is there a way to do it? I mean, and even going back to when I was a little kid, you know, I, I had this job when I was probably eight or ten, uh, and I was a door-to-door salesman selling seeds, you know, like you plant in a garden, like vegetable seeds and flower seeds. And it was really some kind of child labor exploit, uh, exploitation. Because, you know, I think the, the premise was if you could sell 6,000 packs of seeds, you would earn a whistle or, you know, something ridiculous like that. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I did it. Oh, it yeah. It's highly illegal. It's but... numerous laws. Uh, but it would involve going up, knocking on a door, and nine, 99 times out of 100, nothing would happen. Either they wouldn't answer the door or they'd answer the door and shut the door. Uh, but... I imagine most of the kids who would do this would say, okay, the hell with this, and then back to the couch to watch uh, My Three Sons or whatever TV shows were on back in the, in the 60s. Um, but for some reason, you know, I was intrigued. I, I would go, I've got to figure this out. And then somebody would actually buy something, and i go, that was awesome. Now what can I do to try and repeat that? Or what can I do to try and get a bigger order? Or how can I put things together? In other words, I was just drawn to try and figure out better ways to do something. Um, And that never stopped. Um, So this is not like all of a sudden I went to school for entrepreneurship and studied business. And then when I got out, I said, let's start a company. It's this natural progression. I mean, in school, I started clubs, started magazines, um, put on plays just saw something that looked interesting and said, I wonder if I can figure out a way to do it. 
And in many ways, that I was lucky that entrepreneurship actually ended up being uh, something that you can make a living at. Because otherwise, I think someone who was as uh, distracted as I was would be chronically but unemployable. Curious. Um, problem solver. These are these are classic traits of anybody who has found some success in building their own thing. Uh, but you were you were building things before it was cool and before entrepreneurship is glorified. And I think that's also something that um, you speak about quite often. But okay, so let's we'll go into we'll go into what entrepreneurship is and what entrepreneurship isn't um, in a bit. But uh, when when did you decide to? build your own thing versus getting another job what was the what was the origin story of of the netflix uh you know how it started well, with dvds you know, first of all netflix um, wasn't why did that first, happen it wasn't like i was oh i was working in uh safeway as a bagger and i said i've i'm gonna do my no um you know yeah. netflix was startup number six uh and so and the first one's you know, they just kind of come along. Um, Netflix, though, uh, I had already gotten in pretty deep. I mean, I already realized that I loved doing this. Um, and so when the company that I was working at, a company that had acquired my uh, fifth startup, and a company that happened to have been started and was currently being run by Reed Hastings, when we sold that company, and I realized I was going to be out of a job, um, it was a fairly natural thing to say, okay, I'm going to start another one. Uh, and the question, of course, was what? Uh, what the, am I going to start? Because this was not like I was a movie guy, you know, that I was lifelong passion. I wasn't like a Quentin Tarantino who had grown up in a video store or something like that. Um, I had certain things that intrigued me. Um, I certainly wanted to do something with the Internet, which was still pretty early back then. I was really sure I wanted to do something in e-commerce. I was pretty sure I wanted to do something that involved deep personalization. Um, but other than that, I was, I was open. You know, and at the time, uh, Reed, who was at running the company we were selling, um, he was going to be out of a job, too. Uh, he didn't want to start another company. Uh, he was going to go back to school. But he, you know, once you're an entrepreneur, you're always an entrepreneur, and he wanted to try and keep a hand in the startup game. And so we kind of came to this agreement that uh, he'd be my angel investor, mm -hmm. that he would be the chair of the board. Um, uh, we would come up with an idea together, and then I would start it and run it, and that was the plan. And then from there, just began this long cycle of brainstorming and idea validation uh, that eventually did land on something that ended up being interesting. Before we speak about idea validation and how you validated Netflix, um, how did you build this relationship um, with Reed that allowed you to get to the point where he was saying, whatever you start, I want to be the partner. I want to invest in it. Walk me through that co-founder relationship. So I got to go back to startup number five, uh, which was a pretty geeky tech product. I mean, it was doing quality assurance software, the tools that the QA department would use. And we were early. I mean, we had maybe a dozen employees, maybe less, maybe 10 employees, uh, when uh, Reed's company um, bought us. Uh, and so I was plunged from a company which was really pre-product. I mean, we were still in mm -hmm. beta to all of a sudden, th the rest of the team, the engineers, they all went down into the basement um, of this big building to form a business unit to sell that product. And then Reed grabbed me and said, I need a head of corporate marketing. And so all of a sudden, I was taken out of this little 10-person cerebral startup and plunged into this 1,000-plus employee, international, massive software company. Um, but the lucky break, besides the fact we got to sell a company and 
got to work, was that uh, Reed and I lived in the same town. Uh, and so Reed and I began carpooling <laughs> to work every day. And we had six months of carpooling back and forth to get to know each other. Uh, we also, we, we worked together. Um, in fact, one of the very, very, very first things, um, projects he had was he had a big speech to a sales meeting or something like that. And he goes, all right, let's start. For, you got to help me with this. And as you can, as you know, sometimes when you're working on a speech with someone, you mm-hmm. spend a lot of time kind of at the whiteboard, going through ideas, um, helping them practice, helping them rehearse. And uh, I remember him going, wow, he, I think he looked askance a little bit at marketing people. You know, he's a mathematician, he's an engineer. Uh, and I think he kind of was watching how I was working with him on putting together this uh, keynote um, and going, whoa, wow, you're actually pretty good at this. But that was at the very beginning. Um, but we had six months to get to know each other, and we hit it off immediately. I mean, I think we shared a couple of common cultural ingredients that we recognized in each other that I think we recognized were reasonably mm-hmm. rare. I mean, one is that Reed and I were always unsparingly honest with each other. Uh, both of us just coincidentally have never been people who kind of mince words or shade the truth yeah. or avoid saying something because we don't want to hurt someone's feelings. We just kind of say it. Uh, we also loved arguing um, and loved arguing in this totally egoless way where, where you quickly realize you're both arguing not because you're trying to prove that you're right for the sake of you being the one that's right, because you're arguing in his desire to try and find a uh, the right answer. That, that radical candor, yes, and, uh, candor, candor, that's something that, uh, go ahead, no, I was going to say, something that I see very effective, and I, I guess that's, you know, before Kim Scott wrote that book, that's what you were living and breathing at uh, with Reed, and then eventually through Netflix, and I think that that's still, to this day, part of the culture, which I think is very, uh, an important ingredient. Yeah. And that, you know, culture springs from who you are. But in other words, those are the yeah. things. Reed and I did establish both a friendship, uh, professional respect, and this uh, appreciation for entrepreneurship. You know, I had started a bunch of companies. He had started and was running this by now, very large public company. Uh, and so part of the fun game in the car is why isn't there a... Or why can't we? It's the game that all entrepreneurs play where they have no intention necessarily of starting it, but you go to lunch and you begin just throwing ideas back and forth because that's just such an interesting intellectual exercise. And I think that's why that when all of a sudden we uh, sold uh, Reed's company um, and the dust began to settle, it was not this, oh, no, what am I going to do? It was a little bit of glee in that cool we get to uh we get to do it again all right so you and reed um are are in whatever it is you're doing next together um how do you how do you validate that the first iteration of netflix is a viable business that you want to dive into The exercise that Reed and I would go through is uh, he'd pick me up at my house, uh, and we had maybe a 40-minute commute, sometimes a little less, frequently quite a bit more. Um, And besides the usual back and forth, I would pitch ideas to him. (laughs) So I'd get in the car and say, okay, I got one for you. And Boom, here we go. And, you know, one of the ones I pitched kind of famously was this personalized shampoo idea where you'd cut off a lock of your hair, you would mail it to us, and our team of ace hair scientists would formulate a custom blend just for you, Scott. And then you would subscribe to it. Uh, And then you'd pitch the idea, and and Reed would sit there. He's driving and just staring out the window, not saying anything. And a minute would go by. And then maybe a minute and a half or two minutes. And for those who would be unaccustomed to this, it would be an awkward silence. But I'm, you know, I've been through this before because eventually I know it's going to happen. He's going to turn 
He's going to go, that'll never work. And here's why. And he lays it into me. And, you know, here's why the market's wrong. Here's why it's too expensive. Here's why we have government regulation. All the reasons that it's a bad idea. But he doesn't expect that to be the end of the conversation. And it wouldn't be because I'm no, you know, I'm no shrinking violet as that. I, I'd come right back at him and go, no, you're wrong. I've done some research. And, and that's, we'd go into this big, long, one of our famous uh, problem-solving arguments. Uh, and then I'd get to the office and I'd have all this time because uh, I didn't really have much to do because we were in kind of due diligence for the closing of the business. Uh, and I'd do all the research on it and try and figure out are there are flaws that I've seen. Has someone else done this before? Uh, and more often than not, we'd find there was some huge hole we hadn't anticipated, and that goes out the window, and the next morning, and no big deal, I'm ready to go again. Okay, read, custom dog food, you know, or personalized sporting goods. We're going to make either baseball bats or surfboards on a computer-driven milling machine. Uh, and then one of them was, okay, read, video rental by mail. Uh, we're going to let people have a, have a single video store. We will have all the videos available to rent, and we will mail you the movie. And, of course, that had all kinds of flaws. And probably the biggest fundamental flaw of that idea was the fact that back then, this is in 1997, uh, video came on VHS cassette. You know, those big and heavy, plastic, expensive, fragile things. And so that idea quickly turned out not to work. I mean, I, I, I had a lot of mail order experience, um, so I knew what it cost to ship things around the country using DHL and Federal Express. And so that one got abandoned and ended up in a pile on the side of the road. And what actually broke this one open was um, when one morning Reed mentioned he'd heard about this technology called the DVD and wondered if maybe that would be something that might help us um, with that idea we had had a while ago about the uh, video rental by mail. Uh, and, and then here's, I guess, is a long meandering story to get into the whole validation phase. Uh, and this one, because the, the thing is, when Reed and I had ideas we did not that we liked, it wasn't like we all said, great, let's start working on a business plan. Let's not imagine all the things we can do. Let's not work on a pitch deck. We were always shifting gears quickly and saying, how can we validate whether this idea has merit or not, um, short of building the whole company? And in this case, we said, listen, the fundamental premise here is that we can mail DVDs. We can use the U.S. mail. Way cheaper. And... Then you get into this argument, well, was that going to work? Is the disc going to break? What's it going to cost? And we go, screw it. Let's just find out. And so right in the middle of our commute, we turned the car around and drove down to Scotts Valley, where we, where we uh, started, down to Santa Cruz, um, tried to buy a DVD. Of course, there wasn't any. It was in test market. So settled for a used music CD and popped that into a little pink gift envelope like you put a greeting card in. Uh, and mailed it to Reed's house in Santa Cruz. And the very next morning when he came to pick me up, he had a unbroken CD in a little envelope that had gotten to his house in less than 24 hours for the price of a first-class stamp. Um, and that probably was the moment we realized this actually might be worth giving it a shot. So that was the that was the first iteration of of Netflix, and I want to pick up on some themes that have sort of uh, permeated uh, that process, but also things that obviously you speak about now. So before we go down that story even further, the concept of it will never work, the game that you played, why is that your core theme? What does that mean? Why is it so important? This is an entrepreneurial lesson. Well, on the surface, uh, every single person who has an idea, who fancies themselves an entrepreneur, hears that. It's what everybody says when you come rushing with great excitement into the office to tell them this new idea. It's what your wife says to you. It's what your investors say to you. It's what your employees say to you. It is the universal response to, I've got an idea. Uh, but I've realized 
that nobody has any clue whether it's going to work or not. That in fact there is no possible way to really know in advance whether an idea is a good idea or a bad idea without trying it. So that will never work. You know, it's the name of the book. It's the name of the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, it's the name of the clubhouse room. All the things I do revolve around that will never work because it's a reminder to me and I hope to everybody that um, it's just unknowable and that if you let someone say, he, if someone tells you that will never work and you walk away from that going, oh, I guess it won't work, you've made a grave mistake. That what you have to do is go, well, we'll see. Mm -hmm. And then move to that next phase of saying, we're going to figure out some way to find out. But that also ties into another theme that you speak about quite often, where no ideas are good ideas. So it's, a, it's almost at a high level without understanding it's conflicting. Um, but walk me through the, the no ideas are good ideas concept as well. So anyone who's worked in any kind of corporate setting has sat in on a brainstorming meeting where the well-meaning moderator gets up in front of the group and goes, okay, let's get some ground rules uh, here. Uh, rule number one for this brainstorming session is there's no such thing as a bad idea. And I call bullshit on that. Uh, I think, in fact, there's plenty of bad ideas. In fact, I'll go out on a limb and say they're all bad ideas. In fact, there's no such thing as a good idea. Every idea is flawed. They're all not going to work. There's always something wrong. I have never found a successful company that became successful doing the thing they originally envisioned. Uh, and if you recognize that no such thing as a good idea, that they're all bad ideas, what you recognize is it's futile to keep searching for this perfect idea. That in fact, what I've got to do is recognize the skill here is not coming up with good ideas. The skill is figuring out a clever way to try something, to quickly and cheaply and easily collide your idea with reality. That's why this, I, I, I harp on the fact that there's no such thing as a good idea. I don't want people to get stuck in this rut of, I've got to, I keep finding flaws in my, listen, forget it. Stop thinking about it, start doing something. Take the idea and as soon as you can, collide it with reality. And you are going to find out that it's a bad idea, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is not that it's bad. The, the idea is why is it bad? Because usually in, in, in association with all the reasons you realize it's not going to work as you envisioned, it informs your intuition. You get some insight into what might work. And you come, oh, okay, let's try this. And let's try this. And it's that process of iteration, of jumping from stepping stone to stepping stone that ultimately does lead you to a place which is interesting. And, you know, I've, I, I've worked with so many companies, um, I, you know, the size of the companies that I've done, but since I left Netflix, which is, you know, 15 plus years ago, I've now had a chance to work with hundreds of early stage companies and thousands of entrepreneurs. And over and over and over again, the things that finally work are never the first thing you try. It's always this really interesting process of starting and seeing where those collisions with real people lead you. I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, HubSpot. Now, security is one of the major issues big tech is currently facing. From AI scrapes to data leaks, starting your business solidly can be just as difficult as growing it securely. HubSpot is on a mission to help your business grow better with a CRM platform that grows with you. Start your venture with HubSpot's easy-to-use, secure website builder that scales with your business. As you grow, ensure your team of two is just as secure as your team of 200 with secure sign-on, content and asset partitioning, and scalable team permissions. Whatever comes next, make sure your business is ready for it. Learn how your business can grow better at HubSpot.com. Why do you think that so many entrepreneurs seem to over-iterate on that MVP as opposed to trying to have that conflict and real feedback with reality with real people to actually validate very similar to the way that you uh did with just simply mailing uh you know a music cd to to reed's house uh, do you have a 
I, I think, listen, if you're, build, if you're building an MVP, if you're building a minimal viable product, you're building too much. And the, the problem, and it's whether it's an MVP, whether it's actually raising money, all these things that people do because they think that's how this works. You get emotionally invested in an approach. And the more effort you put into that approach, the harder it is for you to acknowledge it's not working, the harder it is to walk away from it. I mean, even a minimal viable product sometimes takes weeks or months uh, or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so you're not about to go, oh, didn't work. Okay, abandon this. Let's try something new, which is why you've got to figure out ways to do it super cheaply, super simply, um, super quickly. And it's parsing it apart. You want to build a minimal unviable product. And, and, and listen, I, I gotta, I'll give you a, a, very con a couple of concrete examples here. Uh, you do not need to test all the components of your idea because most of the components of your idea, if you begin parsing it apart, are not, don't need to be tested. You don't need to say, can we build an app? You don't need to worry, is someone going to trust me with their credit card? You don't need to worry about whether your app can know where you are. I mean, this stuff has been generated not just that it's technically possible, but that customers accept all these things. And you begin to isolate in on what's the one piece of it that I truly don't understand. Well, listen, rather than wasting time with kind of gives high-level Instagram-worthy quote tile bullshit let me give you a specific <laughs> those are also good but i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah and everyone you know it's like but it's like junk food you nod your head and go oh that's so interesting and then you go back and go wait 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 how how do i how do i do this in fact okay so let's have some real examples then let's have a, let's have something promotion tangible. aspect here it's the point yeah. of the podcast that i do which is i could certainly go on social media and say you know you know trick is to quickly easily Clyde, you're the reality, and it won't nod. But then it's missing the how. And so in yeah. the podcast, I'll sit down with someone for half an hour, an hour, who has an idea, and we'll brainstorm through how. And you see how this works. But let me give you a specific example. You do it right now. This is from two or three years ago, a bit more than that, actually. And it's a young woman um, in college uh, and had an idea. And I do a bunch of mentoring work at universities. Uh, and she goes, I had this great idea, quote unquote. Uh, she wants to do peer to peer clothing sharing. She goes, I have all this stuff in my closet that I never wear. I know all my friends have stuff that they don't wear. Wouldn't it be great if we had this huge network of people who were all showing us their clothes? We could all borrow each other's clothes. And I go, okay, pretty cool. What are you, what, what are you warning about? And she goes, well, I, should I quit school to do this? Uh, how do I raise money when I'm just a student? Or how do I find a, a technical co-founder to uh, build this app for me? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, slow down. Um, or more importantly, speed up. I go, let's figure out quickly, cheaply and easily, whether your idea is a good idea or not. Do you have a piece of paper? And she goes, yes. I'm like, college student. I have paper. I go, fine. Do you have a Sharpie? She goes, yeah, I can find a Sharpie. I go, great. So I want you to do is hit the paper. I want you to write in the paper, want to borrow my clothes? Knock. And I want you to tape it right now to your dorm room door. And we're going to start this experiment now. Um, and you're going to find something out. Either no one's going to knock. Well, then you've learned something pretty important right there. But Let's say people do knock. Well, you're going to learn the next phase. Okay, first of all, there's interest, but now what happens? Are there problems with fit? Are there problems with style? Are there problems with taste? And let's say there is a match that way. Now you're going to find out the next thing. How do you feel when your blouse comes back stained or torn? Um, how do you think about the fact you now have to bring everything to the dry cleaners, and all of a sudden this begins costing you more? Let's say it all works, and all of a sudden you're going to start this process of learning and recognize how many times does someone repeat? How do I find people to do this? And you're going to do all of this, not by building an app, not by raising money, not by starting a company. You're going to do it with three by five cards or a yellow pad. You're going to do this in a non-repeatable, non-scalable way because you're going to figure it out on the ground. But the point was, 
Her problem wasn't, well, can I make an app? Uh, how do I get credit cards? How do I, yes, those are things she would have to do if she was to make it a real business. But she narrowed it down to the fundamental problem was, does anyone care? And I can find that out with a piece of paper and a Sharpie. Okay, now I wonder the problems with fit and taste and style. I can find that out on a very, very small scale test of people who live in my hall. And then what will happen is hopefully after six months of doing this out of her dorm room with three by five cards and a yellow pad and going crazy because it's so manual and so labor intensive and so inefficient, but that's great because then when it comes time to say, I think I might like to make this a real business, and you go to raise money, you're not waving your arms and going, imagine if you will. You're able to say, I understand now what the repeat rate is. I know what the average order size is. I know what my churn is. I know what my acquisition costs are. Or, even more importantly, rather than going to an engineering friend and saying, I want you to build my idea, which I can assure you as the marketing guy never works, um, you sit down and go, let me show you what I'm doing. And I'm doing it all with paper. I'm doing the three by five cards. And, and that's when people lean in and go, oh, that's so cool. Maybe we could do it this way or this way. And they get pulled into the problem. So it solves so many problems. But the fundamental one is rather than dreaming about it, you do it quickly and easily and cheaply by parsing out what's the one thing that you really need to test. And once you've figured out that one thing, mm -hmm. usually that one thing can be tried without technology, without raising money, without other people, without an office, without quitting school, without leaving your day job, without mortgaging your house. You can do it on the side. You can do it quickly, cheaply, and easily. It's the trick, the thing that's the most important thing, I believe, for an entrepreneur who's starting something. And what I look for in the entrepreneurs that I want to work with is not how good their idea is. Because as we mentioned, I fundamentally believe all ideas are bad ideas. What I'm looking for is, do I think this person has the creativity and the persistence to say, I'm going to figure out quick, cheap, and easy ways to try this mm -hmm. and keep trying things until I finally stumble on something that actually does work. You mentioned why do people stick with their MVPs for too long? Because they put so much time and effort into it, they're not willing to walk away. But if you stick something on the front of your dorm room, you wrote in a piece of paper, and that doesn't work, well, you wad it up, you throw it in the trash, and you write something different the next day. And then you wad that up and throw that in the trash and try something different the third day, and eventually someone knocks. That's the process. For an entrepreneur, when is the point when they're chasing the new shiny object versus giving up on a potentially viable business idea too soon or holding on to it too long because there's a there's a balancing act they have to have and i know that i've even you know even one lesson from netflix is your decision to enter or not enter canada that's at a macro scale <laughs> a shiny object syndrome but how do you how do you how do you walk work through that problem so that you're not just chasing the next thing because you've given up too quick trying to think what, what the best way to answer this is you know i think that when do you know when it's time to give up is an artificial okay. question uh, i really don't think people ever say that to themselves uh, I, I at least i i mean it's it's an interesting thought experiment but when you're in the trenches, you almost never give up because... Yeah, that's fair. You just don't give up. And, and I'm not saying it's because you're so persistent and bullheaded, but how many entrepreneurs do you know who give up? Almost always you're forced to give up. You run out of money or you run out of time or the things just quite frankly don't work, but you don't like say, oh, all done. You try something else. Um, and that's not to say you stick with the same thing. In mm -hmm. some ways, I give up all the time. I'm giving up constantly. I never get wedded 
to my ideas. Um, I'll, it's not working, fine. In the trash it goes, and I'll try something completely differently. And I'm even willing to do that when the thing I'm giving up is working. It's just not going to be the thing I need to do to be successful in the future. I'm willing to walk away from current success to do what I know the customer is going to do, even if they're totally separate. That, that you, you're... You're, it, what you're talking about is somewhat different than the shiny object problem, which is, I think, different. That's a focus. Pro- that's a focus problem. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. But that's still. I want to. I want to get your input on that as well. <laughs> so let's let's separate those two problems. So the 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 being forced to give up maybe that is a thought experiment maybe you're right if somebody is truly entrepreneurial they will not give up but tons of them don't work tons of them get you know i've got lots of people who have failed companies and that's no you know no badge of shame but it's not like they all of a sudden go well guess there's no more good ideas i guess we're done or boy this is just not working i'm gonna stop and it's the reason is because for most people well, this is a dangerous thing to say, who are in it for the right reasons, uh, mm-hmm. the success part of it is not what they're looking for. As you mentioned, at the, as you recognized in me at the very beginning, it's all about curiosity and solving problems. And the fact that stuff keeps not working just makes you more curious about what is going to work because every failed experiment teaches you something. You become so educated about your problem. It, it, it isn't like you give up on the problem. You give up on the idea in a second. That's why it, they're all bad ideas. But that problem, that never really goes away. But the focus is a different one okay. because there absolutely is a shiny object problem. Um, and there's two types of these um, shiny object problems. One is the fact that when you start, you're dramatically under-resourced. You have a handful, you have just you in your dorm room, to use the example from before. Or even once you start a company, you have just a handful of people. You have limited dollars. You have limited amounts of time. And there's a hundred things that need doing. Uh, And to do all of them well is resources so far beyond what you have. And um, you have to recognize I can't. It's impossible. And the mistake people make is they feel they have to do everything, and so as a result, they do everything to the 20 or 30 percent level. You know, they say we're going to have a marketing program that's 20 or 30 percent, sales program 30 percent, or website 20 30 percent, PR 20. They have this huge list. We're going to need to have a human resources policies. To, we're going to need to write down our company culture. It's, everything is shitty. Um, and half ass and not done well. And yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. just like, but it, it, because they think, oh, I have to have all these things done. Or all of a sudden you launch and you've got your customers saying, we need this feature, we need this feature, we need this feature, this service, this, we need different price plans, we need this geography. Uh, and you can't do all those things well. It's, there's so many things conspire against a startup. That if you going in with everything at this 20 to 30 percent level, uh, you're, you're doomed. So the focus piece is recognizing that fundamentally there's probably just one or two things that if you get them right, all the rest um, takes care of itself. That it really is this triage where of all the things that are on fire, a bunch of them, well, Listen, no matter what you do, they're still going to be poor. So that, that doesn't help. And a bunch of them, they're still going to be fine no matter what you do. But there's a few that your time and attention will make the difference between success and failure. And the skill of an entrepreneur is to recognize what are those two or three things and then have the discipline to focus their time, attention, and the company's resources on those handful of things. It's really, really hard to do. But it's such a critical skill. And like you said, there's always things that are tempting you. And the one you alluded to, of course, at Netflix early days was what we called, you know, the Canada uh, <laughs> problem, which is that people say, you should, wow, we're t- you're trying to grow. You should just expand into Canada. 
uh, that's about an almost instant 10% pop. You know, that market size is about one-tenth of the United States. Uh, it's easy. And one of the lessons, of course, is that this so-called low-hanging fruit rarely is that what seems easy, once you begin getting into it, ends up having all kinds of weird intricacies to it. You know, it's a different language in parts of Canada. Uh, they have a different currency. Uh, there's different rights for some of the movies you're selling and renting. Uh, and the time and attention to get that right for 10% revenue bank gain, that if you took all the time and attention you spend defocusing on going after Canada and focus it on your internal business, you'd reap way more than a 10% gain. And you have to be willing to wait. And another one is all of a sudden people as we begin to get some success, uh, competitors come up. You know, someone launches a Netflix clone in the UK. And believe me, the temptation is huge to say, we better jump into the UK to nip this in the bud. But you have to say no taking our very, very best people and keeping them focused on our internal problem here is going to be much, much more valuable because eventually when we do enter the UK in two or three years, we'll be in such a stronger position. We can't let ourselves get distracted. We can't allow ourselves to get spread too thin. Um, and the uh, now we're getting deep on this one. The other hidden trap is that not only is there a distraction of doing two things at the same time, but those two things cut against each other. In other words, it's not just taking resources and putting it on Canada, but what that does fundamentally is make it worse uh, with, your inter with your core market mm -hmm. because they conflict in many ways. All of a sudden you go, we have to structure it this way For so Canada it remains compatible. And all of a sudden you're going, no, no, that's not what's best for the customer here in the U.S. I go, I know, but we need to compromise a little bit to make it work. Yeah. This is at the very beginning, when we launched Netflix, this is back in 1998, you know, it doesn't look anything like it does now. You know, we were mailing movies to people. There was no, no streaming. Uh, if you wanted a movie, we mailed it to you in a little red envelope. And we didn't just rent movies, we sold them and sold a ton of movies, and it ended up mm -hmm. being something like 95% of our revenue. And this was kind of a version of the Canada principle, but in reverse, is here we had this phenomenal sales business, but kind of recognized strategically this was a bad idea, you know, that eventually Amazon was going to come in, because back then they were just doing books. Then eventually Walmart's going to come in and Kmart and, I don't know, PetSmart. They're all going to begin selling DVDs and then we're toast. But to the point I was just making, the problem is that doing both was making everything more difficult. It was confusing the customers. Uh, the, all, of our, um, all of our metrics were hard to interpret because there was two types of customers. Our checkout process was more complicated than it needed to be to accommodate that some people were renting, some were buying. Our inventory management, I mean, everything was being made more difficult. And we said, we're going to have to focus. We're going to have to pick one of these, uh, which would be hard enough to get right. Uh, and that the big strategic challenge, then, challenge, of course, was which one do you focus on? And do you focus on selling movies, which is 95 plus percent of your revenue? But is eventually going to go out of business? Or do you yeah. focus on rental, which is a tiny piece, but if you can get it right, has the potential of being huge. And so it requires this courage to say, I'm willing to walk away from this, in this case, huge, shiny, huge, extremely shiny object to say, fundamentally, I know what I have to do for the future. And I know that Every minute that I maintain two lines of business is just making it less likely that the one that fundamentally is my future is ever going to see the future. It's interesting that you had to go through that um, because I see that many, many companies seem to launch more products than customers <laughs> than they have customers. <laughs> so it seems so simple at its core, but you you took the executive decision, you made the executive decision, you cut off 
all the sales business and you weathered that storm when i guess i don't really have a question i'm just more curious about the the uh the <laughs> the culture of the company how they survived that how you know what was the living and breathing that day in day out as you went through that process it's terrifying i mean it's it you all of a sudden go from having 90 you know a certain revenue yeah. level down to 5% of that revenue revenue level level and part of your role as a leader is to be able to communicate with clarity and confidence mm -hmm. we're going this way and here's why even if in fact in some cases you're not quite clear or that confident internally that this is the right uh, right path uh, but it's also because in a startup, when you begin building that team, in my opinion, you're less interested in finding people with deep, specific task expertise. You're surrounding yourself with people who have the right mindset to be in a startup, who are totally comfortable with the idea that you're going to be constantly trying things, and when they demonstrate they're not working, mm -hmm. you're going to walk away from them that you're going to come into work each day, maybe doing something completely different than you did the, the previous day. So this wasn't like the challenges that a lot of big companies face when they have to pivot like this. Uh, that is brutal. Um, this was, I won't say it's easy, but I think a lot of people can be shown that fundamentally our future is, in, in that case, rental. And that even though the sales mm -hmm. is quote unquote working, uh, can't you see how it's <laughs> getting in the way of us fundamentally doing the right thing? And it's not like everyone just all of a sudden goes, okay, and off you go. There's a lot of people, of course, who are invested in, um, in certain ways of doing yeah. it. It takes a while to come around. But this is not, um, it, it's, it's a courage thing more than anything it's recognizing that you're willing to walk away right. from something which is quote unquote successful because you see that no the future is somewhere else and netflix has done that over and over again you know well that it seems to be again like this this culture that is ingrained in netflix is is what has led to their success and and part of it is part of it is the ability to make these decisions the the candor the transparency like all this stuff is what obviously you know you look at the end result it's the story tells itself but that's that's the, these are the lessons that entrepreneurs have to internalize when they're starting their own thing and these are things that they have to build into the company from day one it, it is that the you know this is the culture is so is so critical because the you can do it when there's you know i think when we did that walking away from selling dvds you know what were we 30 people 40 people uh, that's reasonably straightforward but when it's 400 people mm -hmm. or 4,000 people it's a it's a very very different story and unless you have this cultural sense that that's the way to approach problems um, it's really really hard and I think that's what gets big companies yeah. in trouble which is that you all of a sudden uh, become successful you all of a sudden find your repeatable, scalable business model, and you realize, wow, I can actually see pretty far into the future. I can see that it's going to go up and up and up and up. And then you say, well, let's begin. Uh, maybe we should begin sh trying to shorten our supply chains. Maybe we should try and shave some margin points. Maybe we should become more efficient. And there is very specialized people who are phenomenally good at that, who are experts in these certain functions. Uh, and the people who are generalists, who are just not super um, talented in a specific task, leave and are replaced by specialists. But then the world changes, and those specialists are not the right people yeah. who are comfortable coming to work the next day doing something completely different. And you get, you get locked in. It's a very, very dangerous situation. And the culture, I think, that Netflix built was in some ways based on this realization, which was we never wanted that to happen. We wanted to never lose that flexibility, that experimentation, that um, risk-taking of a startup, no matter how big the company got. And I think to some degree they've been very successful at that, and it's a big piece of their success. 
Very smart. Um, okay, this was a, a. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, uh, run you too long. But I, I. What I want to do is I want to finish up the Netflix story. I want to speak about <laughs> the stuff that you're working on now. I know I say finish up the Netflix story. It's like you have another four hours. Like no, no, no. We'll try. <laughs> we'll try and wrap up the Netflix story. What you're working on now, and then I have rapid fire questions for you if that's okay okay um I'll, I'll i'll pontificate a little bit less then no it's great it, listen this is uh, this is <laughs> this is your uh, this is your moment um so you you left netflix um why did you feel it was right to leave netflix and move on to something else that was sort of wrapping up a major point in your career obviously yeah it's a you know i as I mentioned, Netflix was, you know, number six. Yeah. So I'd been doing it for a, a long time. And I had learned, um, obviously, a ton of stuff about entrepreneurship and business. But I learned something else pretty fundamentally critical, which is I learned uh, what I liked and I le to do, and I learned what I was good at. Uh, and both of those were the same thing, which was this early stage um, company. Um, business. I love that problem solving. I love coming in and going, how are we going to find the path to something that will work? I love sitting around the table with all the really smart people solving really hard problems. And, you know, by the time I left, which was in 2002, uh, Netflix was no longer a small company. I mean, we had our IPO. Uh, we had found the repeatable scalable model. Um, we were growing like crazy. And at the time, of course, I loved the company. You, know, you love it like you love a child. It's your baby. But I slowly came to the realization that, A, I didn't really like what I was working on. These were not early stage company problems. These were not startup mm -hmm. problems. And perhaps more importantly, I began to realize I'm not very good at it. I'm not a, a big company guy. And you realize, well, in some ways, that's what success is all about, is being able to spend your time working on things that you enjoy and that you're good at. Uh, and that's startups. And so I made a made decision. This is probably I time to go. I mean, it took a long time. It took almost a year to little by little transition all my responsibilities out to other people so that I didn't impact the company. Um, but... Uh, I have zero regrets um, about leaving. Uh, I have gotten a chance to work with lots of early stage companies. I started another company after Netflix. Um, I'm happy as a clam, you know. And, and and Reed, he is running that company, and it's done an unbelievable job, way better uh, than I could ever have done, uh, taking it from where it was when I left to the amazing company that it is today. He is happy as a clam. This worked out great for everybody. One thing you're, one thing obviously you're, uh, you're very good at is being is self aware is being self aware. Excuse me. That's another. You know, I think this was like a a laundry list of all the right things to do or be as an entrepreneur in the past hour. And that's just another. <laughs> it's another thing. You know, know know what you're good at. Know your strengths. Know your weaknesses. Um, is that was that intuitive? Was that something that you've always been aware of, or is that something you had to learn over your career? You have to learn it over your career. No, you, you listen, you, I didn't probably figure some of those important things out about myself until I was at late 20s, maybe even early 30s. I mean, I was lucky. I started Netflix when I was 38. So I had learned the hard way a lot of things about myself. I had been in jobs that I hated. Uh, I, I, you know, I had made big mistakes. So certainly, in fact, one of the reasons that I kind of do what I do, which is where I mentor entrepreneurs, where I do the podcast and do these things, is I'm trying to show people this is not magic, uh, that it's not like all of a sudden I was born as this miraculous startup person. Uh, no, I just I started early, and I just kept sticking at it, and I learned as I went. And the things that I've learned are not beyond the ability of anybody to pick up, as long as you're willing to try long as you take your idea, get it out of your head, and collide it with reality, I mean, as long as you're willing to start, um, you'll learn. And yeah, self-awareness yeah. is important. It's like a lead, follower, get out of the way thing. Yeah, most people 
don't recognize that. And I, unfortunately, a lot of you know, company founders don't recognize that. They, to them, the company's success and their role in the company are inextricably tied together. And I think if you're truly self-aware, you go, okay, I'm phenomenally good at starting companies, but I might not be the right person to take this company to the next level. And at some point, you have to recognize that and say, I'm willing to find someone who uh, can. The number of people who can go from zero to a thousand is mm -hmm. extremely small. You know, I, I count them on two hands probably. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, even Steve Jobs screwed it up royally. Uh, uh, but, you know, like you look at Reed Hastings, uh, you know, Elon Musk maybe, uh, Jeff Bezos. There's not a lot of people who, I mean, there's, there are more, of course, but who can have the skill to be an early stage guy and a late stage person, um, pretty rare. Um, okay, so uh, a few, uh, last last point and then I'll do some rapid fire. So what are you working on now? What's the, the goal of the podcast? Uh, probably uh, is reflected in the book as well. So walk me through that. Yeah, they're, 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 it's all part of the same thing, which is kind of, I've learned over this 40 years that all these tips and tricks and secrets that I've learned in my own career as an entrepreneur are great for starting companies, but they're really the same things you would do if you had any idea you wanted to make real. You know, whether it's starting a company, whether it's just getting a better job at an established company, or whether it's doing something else with your life, it all starts with figuring out, breaking down the problem and saying, how do I take those first steps? And I've really said my whole purpose in life now is to help get people to take those steps, to take the idea and try and make it real. Or if they have it as a side gig, how do you turn the side gig into a real thing? Or if you have a real thing, how do you build that to the next level? And how do you do it in a way that you have a life? Uh, how do you find balance? How do you work with your co-founders? How do you build a board that uh, supports you? And there's all these pieces to it that they don't teach. Uh, everyone says, uh, follow your dreams, but then they, they, no one ever teaches you what, how do you, well, how do we follow your dreams? And that's what I'm really trying to do. I mean, I, the book, yes, it's all the untold stories about starting and growing a company, but it really is me trying to pass along all these things that I've learned, um, about entrepreneurship and how to apply that to business and to your life. You know, I, I, met, I you know, I, I do the podcast where right now every two weeks soon to be every week you know i sit down with an entrepreneur and spend an hour with them uh mm -hmm. trying to help coach them through these are not interviews with celebrity entrepreneurs these are not how i built this episodes these are let's see if we can solve a problem together uh and that's become pretty much what i spend my time now i still work very closely with a handful of companies as a mentor to the founding mm -hmm. teams. I never want to be the guy who talks about stuff that he's not actually doing. Uh, and it's my fix. You know, I, I, like I said, I love the whole startup game. And this is my chance to sit down with that handful of really smart people solving really interesting problems. And then I get to go home at five and they stay up all night uh, trying to solve those problems. <laughs> it it's the best of both worlds, right? <laughs> All right. Um, biggest biggest personal challenge in your career, how did you overcome it? Uh, balance. You know, I, I, I recognized pretty early on I didn't want to be one of those guys who was on their sixth or seventh startup, but also on their sixth or seventh wife. Uh, my <laughs> personal fulfillment as a, as a, uh, for myself is outdoor stuff. You know, so this is doing things which are not the type of activities you can squeeze in between an 11 o'clock phone call and a 2 o'clock meeting. They require m multiple bush plane flights to get back to some yeah. river for kayaking it or even full days of climbing. So if I wanted to have those things in my life and do startups, which tend to be 7 by 24 pursuits, I would have to really figure out a way to do that. And I'm actually pretty proud that I think I have done I'm perhaps prouder of the fact, not that I started all these companies, I'm prouder of the fact that I was able to do that while um, getting out into the woods, going surfing, going mountain biking, going backcountry skiing, um, and, you know, staying married and 
best friends with the same woman for all these years. So there's the, that was my biggest challenge. That's a that's a that's a good way to overcome it and, and challenge challenge successfully completed. Um, okay, still if working. You tell on your it. yeah, <laughs> well, yes, of course. Um, if you could tell your twenty year old self one thing, what would it be? Uh, uh, trust your trust your gut on people. Okay. Trust your gut on uh, direction. Uh, that took me 10 years to figure out, and I wish I had done that a little bit sooner. Uh, the whole, the, the reason I'm hammering on nobody knows anything, the reason I'm hammering on that will never work, is to try and give people the confidence that, no, no, y your intuitions are good. You should uh, follow them, about people and about um, ideas. Um, if you had to choose one person in your life, uh, it could be personal or, you know, career that had a big impact on you who was it and what did they teach you i've really um been incredibly lucky that i've worked with three amazing entrepreneurs early uh and just what i got a chance to do was watch oh God, sorry i didn't have do not disturb no, no, on all of a fine. sudden all kinds of bells and whistles are going <laughs> off in my uh in my ear um, whoa. Yeah, so I've been really incredibly fortunate that I've had a chance to work with uh, some really amazing entrepreneurs, just getting to watch them. One was a guy named Peter Godfrey who uh, hired me to help start a magazine with him and seeing how he worked was amazing. I worked with a guy named Philippe Kahn, founded a company called Borland, um, who I worked with. And there is something that comes from seeing how amazing entrepreneurs work that imprints yourself, which is why I think um, apprenticeship is a powerful thing, is getting a chance to get a front row seat um, with someone who really is good at this is invaluable. Very good. Um, uh, a book or podcast outside of your own that you'd recommend people go check out? I, I'm not a good at recommending that. I don't. I don't. I do listen to a lot of books okay. and podcasts, but not for professional stuff. Okay, no, that's. Fair. I don't learn it that way. It's a. It's. It, it's just honest. I don't. Uh, I, I'm not a big voracious business book reader or a business. Oh, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. It would be something that just has inspired you that that you think other people could benefit from. It's. Yeah, it's I pass. Okay, we'll pass on that one, and then obviously you're gonna you're gonna. <laughs> I, I, I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, don't no, no. speak about things you don't know much about. No, no, I, I appreciate it. That's fine. That. Um, uh, and last question: uh, What does success mean to you? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and in some ways, I answered yeah. it earlier. I've really come to believe that success is this ability to spend your time working um, on things that you really like doing and that you really enjoy. Because if you can put yourself in a position where that's what you get to do, uh, as that old saying goes, it's not work anymore. And if you're driving yourself to work hard for some externality, like uh, money or position or something like that, it's just unsustainable. But if you can find the thing that you really love doing and that you're good at, um, success isn't going to come. Success is already there. Um, sure. But I will close with probably the thing that I'm the most proud of, which is the success of not just having multiple companies which have been successful. Uh, it's the fact that I was able to do that while staying whole. Um, well, I, I still do continually was able to get out um, and do the things I knew that personally fulfilled me, all my outdoor stuff. I was able to stay married to the same woman. She's still my best friend. I have three kids who have grown up knowing me and, as best I can tell, liking me. Um, and I can't think of anything, uh, I can't think of any being more successful than having that be the case. Beautiful. Um, and then where should people go to connect with you, social, get your book, website, all of that? Well, the first thing, of course, is to remember that uh, that will never work because it's the name of the book. Uh, that will never work is the name of the podcast. I do a clubhouse uh, where I do live mentoring for people who, from the audience 
uh, every Tuesday at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific called That Will Never Work. Uh, but the real hub for all things uh, Mark Randolph is markrandolph.com. That's where people can find all my blogs, they can sign up for my email list, doing entrepreneurial advice. They can get the podcast, they can get the book, etc. Plus, if you don't have attention span for a 30 or 40 minute podcast or a 300 page book, uh, you can find it whatever size fits. Be on Twitter or Instagram or you're on TikTok even too. I gotta check that TikTok. out. I didn't know that. <laughs> there's an yeah. There's an there's an adventure. Uh, it I'm is. still trying to find my way. That's a different yeah. beast. But that's the fun thing, isn't it? As long as we're still learning, you know, it never gets old.